make sure you can hear me. Am I coming through loud and clear? Do no, I need to speak louder? A little soft. A little soft. It's never been said by my kids. <laughs> <laughs> that better? No? No. Test? Well, I'll, t I'll start and I'll, t I'll tell me when I need to, to tone it down a little bit. Um, I'm really blessed to be here. Um, and I want to thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to come and speak, um, especially on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, is the evangelization of the family, as well as yours, I'm sure. Um, I thought long and hard about what, what I would bring to add to this room, because I know there's a lot of people in this room who have made a, a big impact in my own life and in my family's life. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Yeah, I can hear it too. All right. Um, what should, much of what I've what I have to say is, is, has been driven and has been a part of my experience as a Regnum Christie family, who's uh, my husband and children, and have all been beneficiaries of, of many of the grace-filled um, service that you've provided through the movement. Um, so I want to publicly thank you. I want to thank you for everything that you do, everything that's impacted my family. Um, I met Christ in the movement. Uh, my life, my marriage, and my family was forever changed. And this, this is my family, um, our kids and, and my grandkids, which is just a, um, the family, really. And they are all here because of the movement and their vocations are a fruit of everything that they've received from the movement as well. Okay, so we're all here. What do we want for the family? What do we want for the family? And I'm going to ask you that question because I know what I want, and I'm sure you maybe want the same thing. There are other things, and I'm, I do a better job when it's a conversation than when if I just stand here and talk. So, what do we want for the family? What are some things, Karen? To ultimately get all of us to heaven. To get to heaven. What else? Unity. Unity. To uh, give my children the tools they need to discover their vocation. To live their vocation. Holiness. Holiness. Yeah. All those things. To pray together. We want them to pray together to discover their mission. We want them to be united in, in the teachings of the church and in our love for Jesus Christ. We want them to know who they are as a human person. Deeply. A son and daughter. Son or daughter of Christ. We want them to know that they, they can flourish. And we want to help them do that. And why the family? And we all know that. The family is the most important part of, of society, the basic unit of everything. And it's a community of persons where we learn to live and love. And it can be said that you can evangelize families, but I propose that we need to evangelize marriages. Because marriage is, is what brings the fruit in a family. And we can all agree, and we can look at some facts that I put together. I'm studying at um, Divine Mercy University, so I've gotten really good at research. <laughs> so I had to put in some um, statistics a little bit. Um, do you all know who David or Brad Wilcox is? He's um, the director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. He does a lot of work on marriage and family studies. And he ha he's um, proposed something or recognized or researched something he calls the marriage gap. And he says that the upper class Americans, over the last four years, their divorce rate has stayed stable. It's been stable. The middle class and lower, that divorce rate has been increasing by 28% in the same period of time. And what's interesting is that the middle class makes up 58% of the population. Kind of, it's, it's like shrinking. He's calling it the marriage gap because there's this huge gap between what was used to be the middle class was the stable part, the bedrock of our country. 
We can also look at Catholic marriages, like another subset of all of those marriages. And, and this was a study done um, by Georgetown University when they looked at marriage. And they said that 60, there's a 64% decline in Catholic marriages. 64%. There's a pair, I've, I'm from a small parish. We have about 600 families. Three marriages this year. Three. My mom said when I was baptized, she said there was 30 baptisms. And the town was only, you know, 200 people. 30 baptisms. Now we have... Maybe 10. So the, our Catholic identity is shrinking. 28% of Catholic marriages end in divorce. Now that's not as what the national average is. It's, it's about 40%. And depending how you crunch the numbers, you can get 50%. So we're doing okay there. But the numbers are decreasing. But the number of Catholics is increasing. How does that work? <laughs> the other thing we can look at is that the quality of the understanding of marriage in the Catholic Church. Where is, that, where is that right now? The USCCB did a study in 2007, it's about 10 years old, and they looked at the state of the sacrament of marriage. They looked at uh, roughly 1,000 people with one person representing about 500,000 other Catholics. And there were some interesting facts there that really was the breakdown in how they <laughs> broke down their subgroups. There were these, they had four subgroups. They have the pre-Vatican II Catholics, and this is I up, up to 10 years, so these are now 75 and up. The, six, the Vatican II Catholics, the post-Vatican II Catholics, and the Millennial Catholics. And they were looking at what the understanding of the faith was in these groups, and they found something sort of interesting was that the pre-Vatican II and the Millennials actually knew the basics of their faith pretty well. The middle group, their faith was an experience. So based on their experience is how they believe the faith. And I think in both all those two cases, we can still look at there's a huge opportunity to evangelize, especially considering the statistics on marriage, the decreasing number of marriages. All of that shows us that there's a need there, a need for evangelization, a need for conversion of heart, a need for conversion in the family. And maybe in my own experiences, and maybe some of yours, early in my marriage, I left my husband. I left it because I thought I needed a soulmate. I needed something better than this. I, I also thought about Sunday Mass when we, I would do child care. I kind of defined that myself, too. If I did child care for a Sunday Mass, I did my Sunday obligation, right? I was there at the church Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so a need for evangelization. In the church, there's a, there's a standard definition of uh, an understanding of evangelization, and there's different ministries that have different words for it. Sherry Wells Waddell, she talks about forming the intentional apostle, and she has five intentional conversion, thresholds of conversion. Trust, <clears throat> spiritual curiosity, spiritual openness, spiritual seeking, intentional discipleship. Ascension Press, they have their definition or how they look at um, evangelization. It's called the continuum and it's discovery, evangelization, formation. The science of psychology even talks about change and changing in a, in a person's heart. When I first started with Cana Family Institute, we went to a conference for the, uh, the National um, Conference for, the, for Catholic Family Life Ministers, and I met a couple of psychologists, and they were talking about their program, which was rather interesting. They talked about, they did a, uh, put a program together that, that showed how science, neuroscience, matched up with the Catholic teaching. And they had like 12 lessons. It was fascinating how all of the Catholic teaching is being supported by science. Well, what do you do then? What do you do? Okay, well, I work with a, an organization. We help parishes with, to form small groups of mothers of young children, parents, husbands, and fathers, and to teach them their faith. And we mentor and train them. And through that small group, they just have a courage to live their faith intentionally. And, and there's a conversion that happens. And he said, well, you have, you're helping people come to a level two change. Okay. <laughs> it's a level two change. Said, well, a level one change is when you decide you're going to rearrange your living room. You change something. No big deal. A level two change is when you make a fundamental change in how you think about something. So maybe it moves from your head to your heart. 
So you decide, I am going to look at my parents in a positive way, despite what I may have experienced as a child, I'm going to accept and forgive them. That's a level two change, that you're changing your heart. And so when Cana Family Institute, and I think you're going to recognize this, is how we look at evangelization, that they mirror each other. And it's a commitment to the effectiveness of small groups that we use this process of change that we call the virtuous circle. It, it's how we evangelize the family, and I think you're going to recognize it as it mirrors our, our commitment in Reagan Christie. So, the virtue, it's called, we call it the virtuous circle. You're probably familiar with the, the vicious circle, you know. <laughs> I smoked, so I quit smoking, and I gained weight, and I get depressed, and I start smoking again, <laughs> I gain weight. I, you know, that vicious circle, or the song that, um, Lamb Chop, this is the song that never ends. <laughs> it goes on and on, my friends, and you're trying to get the stop button on the, the TV, because it goes on and on. But the virtuous circle is the same thing. Once you get it going, it has great benefits. And especially, I'm going to talk about it in relation to small groups. So first you have the invitation. This is the invitation that is made by a trusted friend, a trusted authority, someone that, that you know to participate in an event, in a mission, in a small group. How many times have you heard, how did you get here? What brought you here? Well, someone invited me. Someone invited me. That invitation is a gift that we give someone else. It's the beginning of everything. Second, the next step is conversion and discovery. We start to wrestle with the truth. We start to see the teachings maybe in this study that we're doing. We start to wrestle with it. There's charity in a, in a small group. We're all helping each other to do better. There's friendship that develops. There's a guidance by a, t a, a leader, someone who's caring for each person, who listens, who prays with and for each person. And there's a big temptation here, I think, sometimes in this discovery phase for us to teach. Like, I'll hand you a book, just go read this. Go listen to this talk, you'll get it. Or let me tell you what to do. That's a good one, too. But discovery really is something that comes from within, and it takes time and patience and care. It's interactive. It's not a lecture. The third step, value. As the group begins to wrestle with things, they're praying together, they're getting to know each other, the d discussions become more dynamic, they may attend events together, and they start to build that relationship. And they start to look at each other and they value the impact of that relationship and they say, I, I, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. I want to change something. I'm starting to value this. Oh my gosh, what does that mean? How do I do that? And in a small group you start to wrestle with some of that. And the most important part there is the testimony of each other we have with each other. We might struggle in an area, a friend of ours, may struggle in an area that I don't struggle with. We help each other. The fourth step is to live. These things move from our head to our heart, and we start to practice them. We start to understand what it means to live it. <clears throat> and we do this, and this whole process is what we call, we put it into a learning pyramid, and you've probably seen this in other places as well. And it, it kind of talks about the depth of understanding that, and the retention rates that happen. So what I'm doing here right now, lecturing, is the smallest, 5%. 5% of what you hear today is what you'll probably remember. Now if I had some really dynamic slides and I had a video and I maybe did a skit up here, <laughs> you would, you know, move down to 20% or even 30%. If we could have time to break into small groups and we talk about it a little bit, you're going to move even deeper into it. But if you had to go back to your localities and you had to prepare this talk to present to your team leaders or your women or men, you'd retain about 90% of it. In a small group, that's what happens, is you're learning and teaching each other as, as you go. You're not listening to a lecture. You're not just reading things. You're talking about it. You go home and practice it. You're deepening that level. And then this is where that personal accompaniment is so key. <clears throat> Evangelization doesn't happen by the masses. There's lots of big, big events out there, lots of big gatherings, and those are great, and we need those because hearts are being awakened. 
But it takes that invitation, that person-to-person -person invitation, to bring it to the heart. So we begin to live it. We, have the, we begin to have courage. And we talk to our husbands. We talk to our wives about where, what we're understanding. <coughs> we teach it to our children. I have one story of a woman. We met with a group of, of moms, and we just asked them to share a little bit about their experience. And this one mom raised her hand. She said, well, this isn't really a big thing, but one of our resolutions was to um, buy a, a statue of Our Lady and, and, and put it in our living room. <coughs> pray a Hail Mary every night with our family. I'm sitting there going, that's a big thing. <laughs> but she's like, she'd never done it before. She said, but you know what happened? We prayed you know, our Hail Mary before Our Lady. And one day I was walking through the living room and I saw my little three-year-old kneeling down in front of Our Lady, praying for her sister. I'm like, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. It comes from a resolution that's been made of a culture change in that family because of each of those men or women, whoever it is, building each other up to, to take that leap of faith. To take that leap of faith. And to trust in the relationships that they've been brought into to be able to do that and to be able to come back to the group and say, this is how it went, this is how it didn't go. And to be, you know, it's okay. Well, try the next thing. And they begin to experience God's love for them through the other people in the group. And what happens then is when you start to feel God's love, where do you go? You go to your friend You say, hey, I just found this really great thing. Why don't you come? We start to want to transmit it to other people and invite other people with that invitation that we experienced. So I want to go back a little bit to the beginning and talk about the invitation a little bit because I think this is, again, I want to hear kind of what your thought. When you think, oh, I have to go invite somebody to something. What do you think about? Some people are like, ooh, yippee. Mm -hmm. Other people, you know, rejection. <coughs> what else do we do? I always wonder if it's going to be a good topic or a good presentation. Because then they're going to respond to it. Right. They'll like it. Or, or not. Or not. And then maybe you don't get that opportunity to Yeah, you get burned. Yeah. The next I always think about my motivation. Like, am I inviting them because of something that I think they will benefit from and will help them? Or am I inviting them just because? Just because I, you know, have this need well, to no. invite people or just a, a love you know my own little human littleness of love like I okay I love this person I want them to experience mm -hmm. something good mm -hmm. but is it because I think it's good for them or is it really going to be good for them right yeah so you're like judging they really need this yeah or is it because I think this might help because yeah. it can look the same on the outside right it really is and that intention is so important seeing potential Seeing potential. How many of you do this? Oh, you know, sh she's really busy. <laughs> I just don't think she could do this. I know she's got five kids and she homeschooled and she does all these things and there's no way she could find a way to do X, Y, Z. Like we put roadblocks up for people in that invitation. There's a man in a parish near where I live, a young man. He was, he was in the seminary and now he's married and has a couple kids. And he wants to evangelize. He wants to help his pastor start marriage and family <coughs> ministry in his parish. So he and his family have decided that every Sunday they're going to seek out a family. And they're going to go up and, and they do this. They go up and introduce themselves and then they invite them for dinner. And he's been doing it for a year. And he said, it is really hard. But he has 26 couples that he's brought together that want that they're getting to know each other and now he's looking for something that can really help them. Wow. Speaking of Carrie, um, Holly, Holly Rowley, she had the diaper bag apostolate. <laughs> she had a fistful of flyers in her diaper bag and every Sunday she hand them out to all the young moms around her to invite to a small group. It was the diaper bag apostolate. But that invitation, and it's hard. It's really hard to put yourself out there because someone said, yeah, you're making yourself vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You really are. 
Uh, one of the things that helps do that is when you're convinced <coughs> that you love, like you said, you love them, you want to give them a shot at an experience of Christ, right? That's why that young man and his family, they're convinced <coughs> that the family is what they want to help evangelize, so he's willing to do whatever. Back to the study that we talked about, the 2007 study by the USCCB, there was one, there's a lot, it's a huge report, but there was one um, statistic in there that talked about enrichment programs at the parish. And the question was, how likely are you to think that this enrichment program would help your marriage? The highest percentage was 25% thought, somewhat. <laughs> somewhat. I just think that's amazing. And I think, then I think, okay, why? Well, do they have any relationships there? Has anybody invited them? Or was it in the bulletin? And, you know, the masses come and you see the same people come. So it's missing something. It's missing that, that invitation um, and that uh, chance to be with a community, to, to build in a community. <coughs> we also can think about how many times the Lord invited us over the years. Think back in your own life. Did you see points in your life where, oh, there's an invitation. There was one. I was 14. I saw the, the movie, The Cross and the Switchblade. Have you ever seen that? They had a, it's a movie about uh, street gangs, and there's Pat Boone, I think, is in it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, at the end, there was an altar call. There was an altar call. I was 14, and I went up in this movie theater, and I just gave my heart to Christ right there. Got these little pamphlets, went home, fell away. None of my friends were doing that. There was no youth ministry. So I get to college. Okay, I gotta figure out this dating thing and what it means, what that all means. So I take a class and I learn a few things and none of my friends are doing that. Fell away again. I get married. You know, I'm looking for a group of friends. Not finding busy mom at home, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, fell away again. I gotta get out of here. God spared me. Judy was talking about when you met the Lord. When I got down on my knees and said, whatever you want, I want my family, I want my kids to have a dad and a mom. And for the next, it took 10 years for us to recover from that time. But I went with my friend to the parish. And I met these two women who came to talk about how they could help families. One of them was Elaine Eastman. I don't know if you know Elaine. Elaine died a couple of years ago. She was 50, 65 when I met her. Her and a, a group of other couples started Familia then. They were all 55 years and older. Wow. And older. 55 years and older. I kept talking to some people. Either heading there or there. <laughs> Elaine was an apostle until the day she died. She drove people to clinics, visits. She, when she moved into the assisted living, she was evangelizing her neighbors. She was inviting, always, to that deep community of Christ, that deep relationship with him, with other people. Recently, I heard a, a talk from our bishop, and you'll get to hear him in a little bit. I have a little clip of his, and he talked about evangelizing young people. We hear a lot about that. We've got to evangelize our young people. There's all kinds of statistics on that, too, like how long do they live their faith after they leave the youth groups? 60 to 70 percent of young people are leaving their faith, and sadly, most of them aren't coming back. And there's this whole group, you've probably heard of it, the nuns, not the sisters. But the 40% the of young people who say that their religious affiliation is none, don't have any. But he said the statistic that was, um, he, he was quoting from a study that was done at the University of Notre Dame by Christian Smith in the National Study of Youth and Religion. He said over a 10-year period, they looked at what was the essential statistical factor that made it, the best chance that a young person would live the faith. You know what it was? The father, the father, parents, parents. 
Youth groups are great. Catholic schools are great. Catechetical teaching is, is great. Good liturgy is great. But when all is said and done statistically, it's the parents. If the parents, and there's two things, if the parents go to Mass every Sunday, and the second is if they talk about their faith at home. They base their decisions on their faith. They wrestle with things with their kids around their faith. And that's really a sign of hope for us, an opportunity for us to help parishes help parents. Now that we know that we're, we know of the need, we're convinced of the fruit, we're convinced to make event, uh, invitations, but there's no real easy fix either. There's not a silver bullet. I'm not here to sit here and tell you, okay, you do this and this and this and this, X, Y, Z, done. It's a multifaceted approach. And so what we're aiming for is we're aiming to help the parents. And the parents have some basic needs to be able to understand as parents. First, they want to know what it means to be a woman or a man, as the case may be. Second, they want to know what it means to love in their vocation. I have women, young women I know, who've been through Catholic education, and they come to small groups for moms. And they're like, oh, that's what that meant. Mm -hmm. They know what it means that their husband is different than them. They grew up thinking, oh, it's just like me. Even though they both had Catholic education, they want to know what it means to love in their vocation as a wife, as a husband. They want to know how to have a relationship with God. They want to know how to pray. They want to know what it means to have a relationship with God. Maybe they know the, the art of prayer. They want, to, they want to be equipped to be able to serve they want to be able to give what they've received. They want to have received so they can give. That's our number one goal, to lead souls to Christ, to lead parents to Christ, to, to form leaders. Parents are leaders. They give Christ to their families. And, their, and when a family is living what its mission is, they are evangelizing other families. That's what happens, that families do be, and you will speak. Volumes. And doesn't that sound familiar that the, for the things about, you know, who am I as a woman or man, who am I as my vocation, who am I in relationship with God, and, and how can I be equipped? I'm like, hmm, spiritual, apostolic, intellectual, those four things that we all know about in, in the movement. And I think, oh my gosh, that's what happened to me. That's what happened when I started in Familia and I joined the movement and I went to retreats and I had spiritual direction and all of those things that helped me be who I'm called to be. I met Christ through that outreach in the movement. And he, perceived, and he helped me find a way to persevere. Bishop Andrew Cousins is our auxiliary bishop, and he kind of outlined what that fruit looks like. And I'm going to play that for you. Thank you. 
observe that children can have faith experiences, but they're not afraid to talk about their faith experiences. Right? They're not afraid to share what they've experienced. But the beautiful thing is if you're able to, for example, share an insight that you had in prayer with each other, right? Because it makes sense. So there's this whole world out there where I can go and hear God's voice and know his love for me and the imagination opens up and it allows them then to begin to process their own experiences, right? I did this once with my nieces and nephews. I'm not sure how it worked, but it wasn't bad anyway. But I tried to teach them the same nieces as rules for the seven of spirits. <laughs> so for about six months, every Sunday night, I was at my sister's house and my, you know, they were aged like 16 to four at the time. <laughs> and I would give examples, etc. But at least for some of the older ones, it really it gave them a vocabulary. So here I was talking about my faith experience, and it gave them a vocabulary to talk about it. And then they were able to have, open themselves to certain experiences of God. Um, the third thing. They surround their children with multifaceted and consistent Catholic content. So multifaceted and consistent Catholic content. So that means both within and out the home, right? So different ways that they come to understand the Catholic worldview, right? It surrounds them. So it's not just something they hear from their parents, but their parents have friends who also believe these same things, right? And they have other friends who begin to experience this. And it's consistent, right? It's, it's giving the same message that they're getting from their parents in the home. Again, these things require attention. There's some great examples of things, ways you can do this. You know, first is just, of course, consistent family prayer, right? Consistent time to pray together as a family. It doesn't have to be big things, you know? You don't have to do a whole world you? <laughs> sometimes it's a little bit funny. If you do it, great. But even sometimes just, just consistent family prayer, right? Just having a way that every day we take some time to pray together. Puts in their head this idea. This is part of a consistent witness. It's part of a multifaceted approach. We don't just go to church and pray at home. We have conversations around meals. Now, my parents did this very well, actually. We always had dinner together was a was a big thing in the cousin's household growing up. You know, you, you really had to excuse not to be there. But you know, even in high school, we were all in sports, etc. We had to wait until we could have dinner together, and. Uh, and we always had intentional conversations at dinner, you know, so we would talk about the elections, or we would talk about whatever, but often from the different perspective of faith, right? It was normal. In fact, it was normal to have a priest at the table sometimes, right? Uh, it was just part of life. It was this multifaceted idea of, of the Catholic faith. Other great examples, go on pilgrimage together, right? We create these, like, Catholic memories, right? We go on pilgrimage together, and, Kids remember that stuff, you know? We're going to confession together as a family. Right? They all go together to confession. They see mom and dad going to confession. When I was in high school, the deal was if I wanted to take the car out on Saturday night, I had to go to confession. <laughs> and I was doing that kid that, you know, I just would go. Like, I, you know, <laughs> we were my friend. We'd go to the movie when I didn't have the car. We'd go to confession first, and then we'd go to the movie, you know? <laughs>
us, who, and if it's not now, when. 